Uh, so getting started here, we do have uh, two presenters, co-presenters today, uh, Jerry Hughes from Compass IT Compliance and Lynn Friedman from Robinson and Cole. I'm going to give a brief background uh, and introduce these two uh, awesome presenters and speakers, and then we'll go ahead and get started. The format of the webinar, just to let everybody know, is we're going to have some questions that I'm going to ask of both participants, and we'll give them the opportunity to uh, provide answers and some feedback and expand upon the points that are made. So. Uh, first of all, I'll start with Jerry Hughes. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Jerry. Jerry is a founding member of Compass IT Compliance and has over 35 years of experience helping companies become compliant with internal industry and government regulations. Jerry holds a long list of professional certifications and has extensive IT auditing experience, especially within the financial industry and retail sectors. Jerry carries an undergraduate degree in applied mathematics for engineers and a minor in computer science from the University of Rhode Island. Jerry has developed Compass IT Compliance into one of the nation's premier consulting firms in the area to, excuse me, areas of IT governance, assurance, security, and compliance services. Lynn Friedman practices data privacy and cybersecurity law in complex litigation. She chairs Robinson and Cole's data privacy and cybersecurity team. Ms. Friedman focuses her practice on compliance with state and federal data privacy and security laws and regulations, as well as emergency data breach response, mitigation, and litigation. She also counsels clients on state and federal investigations and enforcement actions. Ms. Friedman is an adjunct professor at Brown University in the Executive, Mas in the executive Master's in Cybersecurity Program and at Roger Williams University School of Law Teaching Privacy Law. Uh, in addition, Ms. Friedman has been nationally ranked in Chambers USA, America's leading lawyers for business in the area of privacy law since 2012, was named in Becker Health's Women to Watch in Health IT in 2020, and is frequently interviewed and quoted in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal and National Public Radio. Uh, so, as you can see, we have some very, very, very experienced presenters on today. So I think you guys will find this very valuable. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the first one. We'll give each uh, uh, of our presenters the opportunity to answer. So the first question that we're going to kind of throw out there is, could you please take a moment to talk about the privacy regulations that have been released in recent years, such as GDPR, CCPA, uh, privacy law in Colorado? as well as new proposed regulations. And Jerry, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeff, I appreciate it. And uh, Lynn, thank you for joining us too also today, this is great. And the folks that made the time today for uh, this presentation, I think you'll find it uh, worth your while. So please uh, fire your questions over uh, during the presentation as needed. So, so to answer that question, Jeff, with respect to the laws that have come out most recently, certainly with GDPR uh, from the European Union, as well as you know, others like from CCPA, from the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, and, and some of the others with New York Shield and some other states as well. What you're kind of seeing is a, a real ramp up, if you will, of, of these regulations uh, surrounding the privacy of information. You know, and if, if, as if that wasn't enough uh, on the heels of what this country is experiencing and actually the world is experiencing uh, with this pandemic, it's introducing uh, a number uh, of opportunities uh, for uh, you know, business opportunities for sure, but unfortunately, uh, opportunities for bad actors as well. So these laws uh, are, you know, timely in the sense that they uh, have come out, uh, you know, just in time for what we're, we're on the heels of right now with going through this pandemic and finally, eventually, hopefully shortly getting through that, there's going to be a lot of changes. And uh, I think these, these laws gear up for that. You know, the, uh, what a lot of these have uh, in common really um, are, you know, there's a couple of common threads, uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, understanding first where your uh, privacy information resides, right? So understand what kind of information your organization uh, stores and, and where that is, you know, and how that flows through your systems and how it's protected, things like that. So if you look at that, uh, every one of these that uh, Jeff mentioned and, and some of the others, they all, they all stem from understanding that and, and then requiring uh, controls and, and protection around that most private information of, of consumers. Um, it gets very complex. Uh, some of these are certainly they have different nuances, but all of them have a flavor of uh, penalty. And I'm sure then we'll cover some of that with respect to the different regulations 
uh, that are out there. But essentially, um, you know, the big uh, features or facets of these are that the consumer is afforded the opportunity uh, to opt out, right? To to uh, reach out to an organization that may have their um, personal identifiable information, uh, you know, their uh, privacy information uh, maintained as part of their business. Um, they can reach out and say, look, you know, I no longer want that uh, information to be utilized by your organization or third parties that you that you have or that you use. So that, that gives uh, a little bit of control, you know, back to the consumer. We saw this uh, actually, you know, way back with um, the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, even some of that with respect to um, an opt-out facet of that to allow, again, consumers to kind of have some say in where their information, uh, you know, is, is used and what what other, uh, you know, because it's not always just one firm that you do business with. And that firm may then share that content with service providers, you know, to help uh, along the process. And uh, finally, unfortunately, we do have laws like this um, on the books now and more and more. Um, I, I expect that you're going to see that sweeping uh, not only this country, but the world in, in different places. Um, so that's kind of hopefully I kind of touch on a lot of that and turn it over to Lynn um, for your comments, Lynn. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, yeah, the, the, this whole area of privacy laws, uh, it's rapidly changing and the GDPR really, I think, started the momentum. And uh, here in the United States, the California Consumer Privacy Act was enacted and went into effect in January of 2020. And that re really was a wake up call for most companies in the United States that might not be international because it, it includes even consumers that might be hitting your website, which, you know, that your website's hit by people in all 50 states. What's, what's really, um, I think, compelling about CCPA is that it's very difficult to comply with from a technological standpoint and so is gdpr to some extent but basically uh, it's very difficult for you to be able to find the data that on the person who is asking you to delete it or or have access to it because these data sets have never been um, stored or collected with that in mind so um, i think that a lot of the challenge here for companies from a tech technological standpoint is how do we find that data? How can we store that data? And, and there has to be a mind shift around consumer data, how it's being collected, how it's being stored and how it's being uh, disposed of. Because now for the first time in the United States, um, we have a private right of action. And what that means is this is the first law that allows a consumer, if you have a security breach, to sue you under CCPA for damages in a class action without having to show standing. It can, you don't have to show harm, the mere fact happened. And this is what's really gotten a lot of people's attention. And I think the mind shift now, because many, many states are gonna follow California, we're seeing a lot of states enacting very similar laws. I think companies have to have to come to grips with the fact that they have to change the way they're collecting data. They have to figure out how long to keep it, collect just the minimal amount, be able to sandbox it and delete it at the consumer's request, and also be very aware of the vendors that they're sharing that data with. Excellent. Great stuff. Um, moving on into the next question, what have you guys been seeing in terms of recent cyber intrusion and privacy risks with a remote workforce during COVID-19 and all of these companies that may not have had uh, remote workers were forced to have remote workers? So what have you guys seen on that end? And Lynn, we'll start with you. So I, I do a lot of incident response um, and what I'm seeing now is because companies uh, so rapidly changed from on-site, on-prem to off-site, everyone working out of their homes, uh, they, they weren't able to plan 
the landscape of their technology, of their perimeter, of the security measures to protect. When people are using their own printers, their own routers, their own equipment, um, and being able to roll out a you know VPN and get everybody on it has been very challenging. Well, of course, the bad guys know that, and it's a perfect opportunity for them to take advantage of the fact that IT folks in companies are struggling with getting a handle around all these remote workers. And we're seeing some very vicious uh, ransomware and we're seeing some, a lot of phishing. I mean, phishing has been a, a terrible problem for years. I would say that of all of the data breaches and security incidents that I've been involved in since January, 98% of them were fish, successful phishing incidents. And, and companies aren't, they aren't focused, there, there's so many other things going on. They're not focused with sending out education to their remote workers about, hey, don't forget, you're still gonna be getting these phishing emails, you're still gonna be getting attacked because they're trying to deal with so many other things, um, furloughs and, and income and everything else. So I think, I think the bad guys know this, they're taking advantage of it, and we're seeing, a, a, I'm seeing a, a huge increase in phishing and in ransomware. There's new strains of ransomware including Maze and um, Revil, where they are exfiltrating the data, then they drop the ransomware. They ask you to pay ransomware for the encryption key. If you have a robust backup plan, you say, no, go pound sand. They now show you that they have your data and say, well, pay me now and I'll destroy your data, otherwise I'm going to publish it on the internet. And it's, they're, they're just vicious and they're taking advantage of remote, remote workers. Yeah. Jerry, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, yeah, Lynn, that, excellent, I couldn't agree more. We have a, a security group uh, as part of our compass umbrella and, and headed up by Jesse Roberts. And, uh, he's written articles and published uh, articles on the same subject relative to what we're seeing with ransomware and phishing. Could not agree more. Our incident response uh, program has also been taking off because of those reasons that that uh, Lynn had mentioned. Um, you know, it's it's if you put it's easy to see if you put yourself in the uh, in the eyes of sort of a small business owner or really any any sized organization. But but typically these these folks are challenged with. You know, this pandemic comes came out of nowhere almost, and you know their their first goal is, hey, let me let me see if I can uh, you know get things up and running. You know, keep my employees you know uh, working, uh, make sure that uh, we're able to abide by you know the governors in the respective states and the requirements that are being imposed there. You know, certainly for good reason for the safety of, of our citizens and such. But but then all of a sudden, like Lynn said, uh, you know these folks are all of a sudden uh, chartered or, or to to have these uh, employees of theirs now work from from home. And I I, I authored a recent article on that. Uh, I think it's on our blogs uh, at the Compass site. But exactly about that, right? It's the idea that hey, I'm a small business owner. I I'm feeling good about myself. I got folks working from home, you know. And uh, you know I, I found my my uh, pandemic plan that we wrote way back, uh, you know, ten or fifteen years ago. Dusted it off. And, and uh, I think Charlie knows where the uh, where the closet is that has the rubber gloves and the, and the disinfectant and the masks even. But and you're feeling pretty good about uh, those elements. And then all of a sudden you realize that, wow, I actually don't have enough bandwidth uh, to support everybody pounding through uh, a particular gateway uh, uh, and um, or device. And, and then the other the other challenge of that is even if I'm doing that and, and like Lynn said, you know, uh, folks, am I doing this in a secure way? Am I employing? You know uh, the use of um, a VPN tunnel uh, or uh, multi-factor authentication to ensure that the connections are secure, that folks uh, are authenticated and authorized to to have access into those systems that we used for everyday uh, life. You know, just weeks ago, right? I mean, think about it. It came it came in a wave. It came overnight. And 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 the way it kind of I, I you know draw the analogy of it's just like all of a sudden this this small business owner. Uh, is, is now faced with having these unauthorized or actually now authorized, but these untested 
satellite offices, right? Basically our houses. I'm in my satellite office right now. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you what, uh, it's, you know, multiply that by your employees that are now working from home. And the thought, I, we have a lot of folks that are in the higher ed um, um, vertical and in, 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 in talking with some of our clients about some of that, they're, they're like, you know, we've got folks that still deal with some hard copy stuff. And you need to picture these, these folks with their information laid out on their dining room table. And all of a sudden, you know, family members bringing a few people through the house. And it's like, now, if you're that consumer where that information, uh, you know, your information's on that table and, you know, who's being vetted here, it's just, it's a challenge, right? You know, business owners trying to get, you know, availability, trying to make sure systems are there to support their clients. And then, uh, you know, we're quickly chartered with making sure we have the technical ability to run from home. And even if you do, do I have those security controls uh, in place uh, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing that? And then, oh yeah, privacy. Those consumers trust me with their information. And here it is, uh, information about whether it's healthcare or other private information, you know, it it's, may not be maintained properly. And then let's assume uh, that we'll take it a step further that indeed we did a great job there. We, we checked off all those boxes and we feel pretty good about it. Then you have to ask yourself, are my trusted third party providers that are part of uh, the flow of this, uh, you know, personal and private information through their systems, are they doing the same thing to the level we are? And do we have policies that govern how we do this? There are a boatload of considerations in these businesses how to make those decisions, you know, almost overnight. So the opportunities are, are really endless for bad actors. Jerry, that's a, that's a really great point because um, it's hard enough for companies to grasp their own issues right now with remote workers, but then you still have no idea what your vendors are doing. And you have to assume your vendors are, are challenged just like you are and they're putting you at risk as well so that vendor management piece even though everyone's still still at home that vendor management piece is still really important when it comes to risk management it's a great point great point thank you to both of you there's certainly a lot of implications that people weren't necessarily 100 percent prepared for since this is as uh to use the cliche unprecedented times um so keeping with that theme as most of the states start to go through the process of uh phased reopening has the reopening of workplaces and contact tracing introduced new risks to employee health data and what can employers do to really protect themselves legally and their staff health-wise as they reopen and Lynn, we'll start with you. So many, many companies are um, coming out with new policies and procedures around bringing employees back because under OSHA, you have to keep a safe workplace. And OSHA just came out with some new regs, I think yesterday. You have to keep a safe workplace for your employees. And so there are lots of different ideas out there. One is taking the temperature of every employee before they walk through the door and and have contact tracing apps so that you know which uh, which employee it was close to someone else if they become positive and there's all sorts of it's 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 very um, interesting to follow what I will tell you from the legal standpoint is as an employer in looking at these programs of how you're going to determine whether or not your employees are safe to come back to work, as an employer, you have a lot of leeway to ask people for their information and their health information. There aren't a lot of laws that prohibit you from doing that. However, with that said, be smart about it. If you are going to implement programs where you're taking people's temperature, you're doing contact tracing, you're asking them for information you've never asked them before, I would suggest that you think about that information so that you're only collecting what you need. You're using privacy principles in collecting, maintaining, and disclosing, and keeping it. Uh, only keep it for the amount of time that you need it. You don't want this information hanging around, and we see that a lot in all sorts of different um, industries. 
and be transparent with your employees about what you're doing. Don't do anything on the sly, be transparent, tell them why it's for their safety, but, but have really solid uh, reasons why you're taking it and have really solid uh, procedures around how long you're gonna keep it. Think about it just as you would a workers comp claim, an ADA claim, an FMLA claim, all of that health information that you get as an employer. You should be thinking about this information the same way, but you should also be thinking about uh, destroying it when you no longer need it. I think that's going to be a, a huge part of success in getting employees back to work. Yeah, that's a, that's a excellent, excellent points, uh, Lynn, for sure. You know, and with respect to, um, you know, the different uh, verticals that we serve, you know, whether it's in the banking industry with some of the guidelines from the FFIEC uh, regarding uh, maintaining uh, confidential information, in, in this case, private information for business purposes, you know, lease privileges, everybody's probably heard that term before, uh, or whether we're dealing with uh, some of our clients in the payment card industry, where there are stringent requirements as well regarding record retention, right? Putting those uh, uh, records uh, in, you know, maintaining them in a, in a uh, secure manner for a period of time determined by uh, the need for business purposes and legal purposes. And then from that aspect, making sure that uh, those policies also clearly indicate the secure methods to which they must be um, purged and, and properly deleted. Um, so as part of our audit work and security work that we deal with, the different firms that we deal with in, in all of those industries, you know, a, a strong record retention and destruction policy are paramount. And it's not um, ra rocket science either to get your arms around it, really get having sort of a schedule that rolls up to the policy and the policy just governs the ways, the secure ways and places where they, the private information in this case uh, can be stored or should be stored. And then uh, the data owners uh, surrounding that information um, and then the methods that are approved for the proper and appropriate uh, safe destruction when that uh, information has reached its, um, you know, its, its point of, of termination. You know, one of the key points you know, a few years back and, you know, this looks like it's blonde here, I hope from your side, but it's white actually. Uh, it came back when, when the legislation came out a number of years ago um, regarding, um, you know, when, when information subpoenaed to, uh, you know, if you're subpoenaed for, for court, for example, we did a lot of work with clients that have gone through uh, different, you know, uh, facets of that. And one of the big things was, you know, we, I remember my business partner, Bill and I, we'd be beyond client sites speaking with our clients about information and the importance of having a strong record retention policy and destruction policy. And, and they would say, look, you know, we just save it forever. And they were sort of happy about that statement. And, and I was like, you know, especially when that law had just come out, it was like, you realize this, couple statements here. One is that if you have it, you're legally bound to potentially produce that in a timely fashion or potentially be held in contempt of court. The other aspect of that is, you know, um, we're, we're, our group is a very technical group. That's what our business is. And the idea that this, these older legacy systems, this, these systems aren't all backward compatible by any means. And so if I've got this data in a format, and I may have it very well secured, check all the boxes, right? But then it's like, okay, go ahead and restore that. I, on what? I don't have that technology anymore. We're in 2020 for crying out loud. So, so it presents a boatload of challenges. Our advice uh, to our clients uh, really is, you know, understand, uh, you know, what the data is, where it is, uh, you know, how long you need to legally maintain it. And then for business purposes, how long, you know, it needs to be maintained and maintain it only for that uh, designated uh, period of time. Awesome. Great stuff. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so moving into kind of the next piece here and, and one of the things that I've heard a lot of the folks at Compass and Jerry, you've talked about quite a few times is um, understanding where that data lives, resides, traverses your systems and whatnot. So what are some of the common pain points that that you guys are witnessing organizations go through during privacy assessments and audits? And Jerry, we'll start with you and then go to Lynn. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, great question, right? So uh, I think Lynn mentioned it uh, in, when she first spoke about, you know, these folks maintaining information, uh, you know, as part of their business and some of these systems that they're utilizing weren't designed uh, uh, with the idea that you may have to sort of on a dime uh, remove uh, information on, on a person if they, if they choose to opt out. So there's certainly uh, a number of technical challenges um, that come about when you think about that that concept, right? And so these, uh, some of our clients 
uh, or many of our clients are really struggling with that piece. And then assume again, let's, let's go down this path and take it through, you know, even if they do, uh, you know, have a, a, a good handle on, you know, my main database, I've got it, I'm using uh, TDE or some form of encryption on the data that's in, in the database. And we're really, we've got good controls in place. That's excellent. And then we say, that's great on the system you know about. What about the backups? What about the systems that, you know, the folks in the other uh, departments that are, you know, again, most of the time we find that folks aren't necessarily, uh, you know, have bad intent. They're most most employees are trying to, to do the best they can to perform uh, in their job functions. And sometimes they're doing, you know, they'll throw data into spreadsheets. And that's one of the biggest, I like Excel for what it can do, but man, when we see stuff like that, it is. But then they look at me and they go, well, I password protected it. Uh, and after I'm done laughing, uh, you know, I just honestly, it's, it's it, it, too easy to compromise. Um, the idea is, and the big takeaway from this statement really is, you know, know where your data is, not just the data you know about. And, how do you, and, and the question is, Jerry, how do you, how do you get, uh, you know, your arms around that aspect of it? Um, and, you, you know, through a good uh, data governance program, um, you, uh, that's where you begin, right? To put controls in place there, but tools that do uh, discovery. Um, there are a number of firms we work with and some tools that we utilize that will crawl the network uh, to um, hit all attached devices and to, to call out that data. And you would be blown away by the number of sources where uh, PII and, and certainly privacy, private information of consumers is on local systems, even though the policy says no. And, and the, the employee says, well, we had a good reason for it. That's not the point. Um, you may have great reasons, but at the end of the day, it's living there. Oh, it's on a share. And then we did a backup. And then that time we had a problem, we backed it up extra. So we've got that backup over there on that disc. And, you know, I still have clients that do, tape backups. I don't even want to get into that, but you know, the idea is it's everywhere. Do you know exactly where it is? That's the biggest challenge. And that's the starting point, by the way. So tools that help you move through your system, um, use the technology that's out there, use firms that can handle that. And hopefully that will get you at least started. Yeah. Great point. So, um, it, there are every single time I have an incident, and they say, oh, no, there's no PII. There's no personal information in there. No, there's nothing in that email. There's nothing on that laptop. There's nothing blah, 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 blah in that spreadsheet. A hundred percent of the time there's PII in there and it's, it ends up being a reportable data breach, Jerry. So you're so spot on there and uh, utilizing those tools, finding it ahead of time instead of after the incident is really critical. Um, what I'm finding as well is is clients are really struggling with how do we classify our data with legacy systems, with new systems, with the, the huge amount of data dumps that we get and the collection that we get. And, and what I like to tell clients is you need to take baby steps in this space because you can get really overwhelmed. You need to classify your data. You need to know where it is so that you can protect it. But, um, you have to be thinking behind, but you also have to be thinking forward. So as you're coming out with new programs or services where you're collecting data, that's the time to make sure that you're configuring it in a way that you can comply with all these laws and with the privacy principles going forward. So don't keep doing the bad stuff you've been doing all along. Take take care of it now moving forward and then you can take baby steps going back and using forensic tools and and using e-discovery tools to figure out where the where the high-risk data is and i i i so agree with you jerry that um it's shocking when you find out how much personal information is hiding in all sorts of different places yeah one other thing too if i could add to that lynn is you know with data classification it's it's not only a great suggestion, it's, it's a requirement, right? Do you look at these industries that we do audit work for, their, your requirements are, do you have a policy that governs, you know, the classification of information? Typically, uh, we recommend four levels, you know, where there's, you know, public, and that's your, your website, the information you want the world to see. And then we classify information, uh, you know, internal. So where we got uh, correspondence between maybe two colleagues through an email. Uh, still, you know, if it was compromised, not the end of the world, uh, but not intended for the public, but still nothing confidential within that. 
And then that the third level is the big tier, really, and that's the stuff we're talking about, that, that data, uh, privacy information, uh, the, the our confidential information that's transactional based, or, you know, so all that confidential information is in, you know, um, uh, that, that big tier. And then above that, uh, we have a lot of clients, in, you know, that go to uh, what we call restricted, and that restricted classification typically uh, is, you know, even restricted down to the point where only, you know, board members or, or, or high level folks within the organization have privy to that information. Things like, you know, we're selling the business, we're, we're merging with another company, we're doing this, we're doing that. Also, uh, for software development firms that we do a lot of work with as well, you know, that, uh, you know, they have SDLCs, software development life cycles that they maintain their secret sauce, right? This is the process they follow to develop and safely deploy it. Well, that's, you know, that source code is paramount to their survival and to their business. So, so making sure uh, the classification policies are there and employed. The last note I would mention is the systems I talked about that do that uh, data, it's called data leakage protection, they call it different things, but essentially that crawl the network, you can classify right within that system. So when it identifies you know, uh, certain information, whether it's payment card information uh, or other uh, information, you can literally classify it, you know, custom classify it within uh, your environment. Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you both for that. Um, I'll just make one more kind of um, reminder to the, to the attendees. If you guys have any questions, please make sure that you put them in the Q&A section. We have several that are in there already, uh, but just wanted to put that reminder out there to you folks. Um, so if there's any pressing that you folks want answers to from, from Jerry or from Lynn in regards to this stuff, definitely throw those in there. So moving on to the next question, uh, we always hear about different frameworks, right? And different um, uh, requirements and whatnot. And of course, we've gotten a lot of uh, news lately on the NIST privacy framework. So Jerry, can you share kind of what, what is the NIST privacy framework and where should an organization start? And then we'll sure. move over to Lynn. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. So well, first thing is the NIST privacy framework is a, uh, a long needed, long awaited um, a tool, uh, I think that can help uh, organizations uh, to kind of move through the process of, you know, identifying where information is and going through to assess themselves or have like we do that for a lot of our clients. We'll, we'll be pulled in to um, kind of uh, work our way through. We basically map their environment, their controls uh, to the control objectives within the privacy framework. And really what it is, if you, if you go through it, and we spend a lot of time with it with our, with our clients because there's different ways to, of, of employing the use of it, right? So there's, you know, there are five high-level functions that kind of cover the whole um, I guess the whole idea of privacy, right? And then under that, there are um, 18 uh, categories that it's broken into across those uh, five main functions. And then for the more detailed, uh, you know, larger organizations and uh, shooting for distance, if you will, there's about 100 to 108, I believe it's like 108 controls under that, that sort of, you know, fine tune, if you will, the process um, for, uh, you know, when we assess, we, we can assess to those three different levels. So, we, you know, it will help an organization see where they are. The recommendation is to start with you know, maybe having an assessment performed, right? Relative to those controls surrounding privacy and, and see where I am now relative to where I need to be, right? And then following up after they move uh, to mitigate some of the control weaknesses and, and, and issues surrounding their privacy um, posture at their organization uh, and then reassessing, right? To kind of follow up and see kind of where they were and, and now where they are and the progress there. So I think that's one, certainly one very good way or good recommendation uh, for the use of it. What, one of the things I did want to mention about it, though, uh, also that what we've seen when we work with our clients over the years, I mean, everything from HIPAA way back when it first rolled out with the privacy and security rule, you know, most of our clients just wanted the security rule assessment, right? Not a lot of privacy, uh, well, though we've had a few, but not a lot. It's odd, right? We do SOC 2 type 2 work, which is, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the auditing of the operating effectiveness of controls in an environment for a service organization. And there are, you know, the uh, trust um, principle, uh, service trust criteria rather that uh, the trust services criteria that these organizations have to choose from, five of them, and one of them is privacy. And nobody chooses uh, often the clients that we've seen other assessed by other firms or whether we're working with our partners to go in and, and perform the audits, they often do not select privacy as one of the, um, um, trust uh, services criteria, which is perplexing to me, uh, to say the least. And so you have to ask yourself, why is that? 
right? And, and, and the answer, and if you read the NIST um, the prelog to, to the NIST framework and, and articles around it, it's really because folks struggle to understand, to get their arms around, you know, what is the privacy? It's kind of uh, elusive in the sense that it has to do with information about me, right? It might, might be information about my health condition, um, my likes, dislikes, what I, where I, what I do, where I live. It's about me more than uh, abstract information like uh, when you look at, you talk about privacy versus confidentiality or confidential information. Confidential information is made up of maybe transactions, financial transactions. That needs to be, uh, you know, that's confidential, but it's not have to do with me per se. Whereas, uh, you know, my health condition certainly is, is private information about me. And, um, and then you, you kind of add in the other term I just threw out there about security and, and what's the difference between privacy and security. And, and that is really the, the means to which we protect, whether it's confidential information, transactional, things of that nature, or uh, private information about the person, things like that. Um, so hopefully those three terms, that, you know, while they have some overlap, I think, and are used and misused so many times, hopefully that helps you kind of get your arms around, uh, you know, what those terms are and, and what this NIST framework, uh, this privacy framework, really why it's so, I think, powerful. And I think you're going to see an uptick. I know we are in our organization helping firms uh, go through this. And, and one more last point, I don't want to drone on, but one of the other points, you know, that we've seen uh, recently and kind of is something Lynn touched on is, you know, as you look at this COVID tracking, right, there are folks out there putting for uh, apps on, on phones. And I, I saw an article a little while back regarding uh, these, you know, the smart watches that folks have. One of the guys was saying, one of the developers said, look, we can actually, you know, determine more than just your heart rate. There's, you know, there's certain things that show anomalies relative to respiratory uh, potential issues. You think about that for a second and you bought that watch for your own purpose necessarily probably and you know as well as I do when you when you download these apps a lot of times you're clicking on you know uh, to get this thing installed I have to agree 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 if I want to read through and at my age I got to put the glasses on to do it but flipping through the, the fine print yeah I just want the dang thing to work so I'm going to click agree on this uh, often and, and and what did I just agree to um, and that's where I want to actually I'd love to turn this over to Lynn right now because I got a lot of questions about some of this tracking and the privacy information and uh, some of the legal ramifications, really, Lynn, if you could uh, touch on that, too. Yeah, great point. So we don't have enough time to go through all, everything we want to talk about. But um, so to talk about the privacy framework, I, I think that the the I am a huge fan because we've had the NIST cybersecurity framework for a long time. And I think that the whole um, disconnect between the the privacy and security with all of our clients, Jerry, is the fact that it's always been a data grab, right? Companies are always like, I need the data, I need the data, I'll figure out how to monetize it later, I need all the data I can get, and yeah, click, 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 I agree, I agree, and let's just start, let's just start getting all the data. And now I think consumers are starting to say, whoa, you know, when I, I always tell this story about I was on Amazon and I was looking for a paella pan. I like paella. And I was buying a paella pan and then all of a sudden all the ads come up for paella pans. I'm like, I already bought one people. I don't need another one. Right. So, so, and people are starting to go, Ooh, this is kind of creepy. And then the watch and, and, but, but on the other hand, consumers are, they're giving it all up too because they want, they want the convenience. So I think that the thing that the privacy framework is going to change is there's going to be more of a, consistent look at the collection of personal information, cons primarily consumer information, and, and putting in, I, I write a lot about data ethics, that companies need to be thinking about the ethical collection of consumer data for risk management. Instead of collecting all the data and figuring out what to do with it later and how to monetize it later and then try to get consent later, Think about it up front and be transparent with consumers and tell consumers what you're doing and give consumer rights. And that's really the, the whole point of the privacy framework. And that's the conversation that I'm having with my clients about how to reduce risk. Because every time you collect that data, there's risk associated with it. And you've got to start thinking about it in terms of, is it ethical? Not ethical in the, in the traditional sense, but 
do we have a reason to be collecting that data? Do we have a reason and are we giving something to the consumer? And what I think is really gonna be interesting and then I'll stop is, even though we've got lots to talk about, is now the CCPA allows companies to compensate people for their personal information. So if you give me that information, I'll give you a coupon or I'll send you a penny every time I send your data to another company and we're monetizing it. I think this whole area is going to change dramatically in the next few years and consumers are gonna take more control of their data. As companies and businesses, we need to be ready for that and we need to start putting our technology in place to be able to um, respond to that. Yeah, good, good points then. One note, I, I just, you know, when you, when you look at and talk about some of the stuff with the framework and then with, with the privacy aspects, I know we, when we do work with our clients regarding, uh, you know, compliance and moving toward, you know, making sure that they're protecting this information, they know where it is and all that. We have certainly templates and things we work with to, to help craft privacy uh, statements and opt out statements with our clients, but then refer them to firms like yours, Lynn, right? To, to make sure that, that they're legal, because we're not lawyers. Uh, and that's where uh, organizations like yours are, are phenomenal, right? We, we're technical and we, we handle the compliance aspect. No worries there. But, but when it comes to that, I, I, we advise, you know, our, our security folks and our audit team, which by the way, we went out when all this started going and really blowing up and, um, probably about eight or 10 of us are now certified, um, uh, for for data uh, privacy protection and uh, it's it was just a, a necessity right to so stay up on what's going on I'm certainly very intimate with the with the NIST privacy framework but but my advice for folks taking a stab at it sure but but bounce it off their legal counsel or, or firms firms like yours as well just to make sure they cross the T's and dot the I's the great team effort absolutely Awesome. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question to that last one, because one of the things when anything that's new that's out there, like the NIST privacy framework, and while a lot of the principles are things that organizations have been or should have been doing for quite some time, when it's more formalized like this, there's typically some intrepidation on the, on the result of organizations and saying, well, I'm not ready for an assessment, or I'm not ready to take on that type of, uh, of an assessment at this point in time, or, or we're not going to pass, or we're not going to do well on it. What, what would you guys say to those types of organizations? I think I know the answer to this, but I, I wanted you guys to answer that as well. well go ahead, Lynn. You want to go first? Or? No, you can go. Sure. So, so Jeff, when, when, when you look at the challenges these, these folks have, it's, a lot of times it's overwhelming for them, right? Uh, you know, they may be great, and I'm sure they're great at what they do, right? Whether it's a small mom and pop shop that specializes in something, uh, you know, privacy isn't really what they set that business up for. So they, they struggle just understanding what's even required. I look at some of these requirements and these regulations and we go around and around on it. We consult with legal firms to make sure that we're getting our arms around it as well. And until things go to court, sometimes some of the, you know, the pendulum swings, swings far often initially, and then it swings back to more of a norm that makes sense. But until it really plays out in court, you know, folks are still going, we'll see where this, where this is going. So, so I guess, uh, you know, my, when I look at that, you know, or try to address that question, Jeff, with respect, uh, you know, to, you know, the challenges for these businesses, I think, you know, start with, um, you know, pulling in firms that they, they can trust to at least start somewhere, right? I don't recommend a deep dive audit right out of the gates, but let's go through and assess ourselves. Let's ask ourselves some basic, basic questions about data privacy and the protection of that information. We have a uh, 12, point, just simple questionnaire on our site that just, it's just a great guide. Answer yes or no, just simple questions. And if you answer yes to any of those, you might want to reach out to somebody. We certainly do it, but there's a lot of good firms that do that. And then a lot of those, uh, you know, we would defer, obviously, the legal aspects to firms like Lynn's because, you know, that's not what we do great. I and mean, that's what her firm specializes in. That's my quick answer. I think it's quick. <laughs> yeah, and my, my response is, is very consistent. I think putting your head in the sand is not the way to try to do the right thing or to comply. And although the, the, pri the, the great thing about the privacy framework is that it's, um, it's not a regulation or a law, it's really help. And so trying to wrap your arms around it and start from my perspective, taking baby steps is better than taking no steps. When GDPR came out, a lot of companies were like, well, we're just gonna wait and see. We're just gonna wait and see. And a lot of companies are saying that about CCPA. And, and my attitude about it is as a former regulator, 
as a former assistant attorney general, I'm going to say, if I'm coming in to audit you from a compliance standpoint, if you're trying and you're determining whether it applies to you and you're trying to comply with the spirit of the law, you're going to get way farther with me than if you put your head in the sand. So I, I think I, I think that the the best way to handle it is you can watch as guidance comes out, but you really need to address it and at least document that you've tried to address it in the event that you have to prove something to a regulator. Yeah, great point. That is a great point. Some efforts better than better than no effort by any stretch. That's a good, very good point. Um, so we're going to start to get to the Q&A section of it. And we've had a bunch of people put some questions in there. So thank you to the uh, attendees for doing that. And again, if anybody has any questions that uh, they've been prompted and they want to ask, feel free to please put those in there at this point in time so we can start to go through and, and answer this. Um, so I'll go with the first question here. Uh, and it's from Dan. And Dan asks, uh, has Compass IT kept up with every state's status of putting their own privacy laws into place or not, as New York and California have done? So, Jerry, I'll defer that one to you. Right. So more than New York and California. But y yes, our group, um, again, I mentioned we're a number of certified uh, data privacy solutions engineers. And, and, and uh, you know, one of the big things to to to, to address that whole arena is really understanding what the different requirements in, are in uh, by state, right? So each state has somewhat different, right? California is uh, different than some of the privacy, like Mass 201 CMR 17, uh, the great state of Massachusetts. They've got a lot of, um, you know, specific requirements around, um, you know, privacy as, as does New York and Texas and some other states, but they are all different for sure. And, and my, my real message there real quickly is simply that, you know what, I, if I'm the big key for all these is, is really the protection of the consumer's information, right? The privacy, my private information being maintained by different organizations. It follows me as a consumer of a particular state. So the big thing is understanding that regardless of where your business is, if you're serving consumers across the country, you're, you know, they're protected by this, their state. So you need to really understand all of that. So, so uh, as a business, start with knowing where it is and, and protecting it. But yeah, we have to keep our, uh, uh, our eyes on all of those changing uh, laws. Yeah, I would just add that um, obviously we, we we are um, following all of them, and we represent international companies that have to comply with you know a gazillion different laws. So when you're thinking about that, particularly in the United States, when you're thinking about it, um, I would suggest instead of trying to comply with every single letter of every law of all 50 states. Uh, what, we, what we tend to do is, is comply with the strictest for now, and then when something comes out that's stricter, comply with that, and the other 49 will usually follow. Beautiful, great answers, thank you both. Um, moving on to the next question from Andrew. And this is actually a great question. I read it while you guys were answering. And this is a really, it's, I'm interested to see the answers to this one. This is going to be good. So uh, what about data privacy for employees to opt to use personal devices for work activities, which are allowed by company policy, since they're connecting to our corporate networks? Don't we need to perform our due diligence and at least partially invade their privacy to a degree to ensure we are protecting both our corporate data and the data of our customers that we may hold in emails or in network files. Okay, can I take that one first? Sure, you may. Okay. Um, this is a long-standing problem. This isn't a new problem, but it's probably more enhanced because of everyone working from home. Um, the, the way most companies deal with this is to implement uh, a mobile management software and a bring your own device program. And I, I will admit I, I am an anti-policy person because as a litigator, if, if there's a policy and it's broken, it's really hard to defend. I'm a program girl, I'm a guidelines girl, I'm a procedure girl. I'm not a girl anymore either, but you know. So, so what I would say is um, look into the pros and cons of a bring your own device program and uh, if you intend to implement a bring your own device program, 
Uh, make sure that you are um, telling your employees that they don't have a right to privacy if they're if they're getting information for their convenience off of their phone for the company. However, that being said, there are many great applications out there where you can sandbox the company data from their private data because they get all squirrely about their photographs and their music. You don't need access to that. You just need to make sure that the company data is sandboxed. If they lose their phone, you can remote wipe it. It doesn't remote wipe everything else on their phone, but make sure you're being transparent about the fact that you can look at their emails that they're using on your, on your assets. You have the right to monitor your own assets. Just because you're putting a mobile management software on their phone doesn't mean that you can access everything, all their personal stuff. So I'm a big fan of a BYOD program for companies. Excellent points, Lynn. Yeah, and I, I'd just add to some of that on, on the other side a little bit, um, you know, with respect from our, from our perspective, when we audit, we audit to, to controls and many of these controls live in the policies uh, in, in, in some of the industries that we do business in, they're highly regulated. So, so having, uh, boy, when you have a bring your own, device or work from home kind of policies. There's a boatload of considerations. You touched on so many of them and there's just so many more too, um, you know, relative to even the workspace like we talked about uh, earlier, you know, where they're working at, and not only the device itself, but that information being available to them. And, uh, you know, while it's tempting to say, look, you know what, we are going to save on brick and mortar by having folks work remotely. I think we're going to learn a lot of lessons from this pandemic for sure. Um, you know, some that we didn't expect we would learn. Um, but the other aspect of it is when you've got folks and another temptation is, hey, you know what? They, they've got devices like phones. Think about it, if you are uh, paying for your employees phone plans and things of that nature. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole boatload of considerations there as well I mean, from a cost perspective. But the other, you know, and there's also potential cost savings if they've got their own devices, you know, systems. But then you, once you open that door, you've got uh, security controls, privacy controls that need to be in place. And how are you going to monitor that? Because when you say the keyword for me, Lynn, was really program, and I couldn't agree more. Program being, you know, for me, it's policies, procedures. It's that ongoing monitoring and assessing to ensure that, you know, the information that, that these employees of a particular company are being entrusted to protect on behalf of their consumers and their, their clients. And that's, the, that's the goal, right, is really looking after that information. So, boy, when you, when you embark on it, I would say if you're not sure about it, reach out to firms like Compass. Uh, or, or Lynn, you know, your firm is, is phenomenal at, you know, handling certainly the legal aspects of those, uh, which we would, again, throw your way because I'm not going to deal with the, uh, the legal uh, ramifications, but from, from the program perspective and the audit perspective and complying with some of these regulations, you know, we certainly can help you, uh, you know, achieve those objectives. Awesome. Thank you both. Great answers. Uh, the next question have there been any lawsuits under CCPA or the California Consumer Privacy Act? And Lynn, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, there have been a couple. Um, now, remember that in order to have a private right of action, you have to give the company notice of the breach so, and, and an opportunity to cure. And it, so if there's a security incident and personal information is unauthorized, uh, there's an unauthorized access user disclosure of the personal information, the consumer has to show that you basically had lax security measures in place. They have to provide you with notice to cure, and then they can sue. We're finding, I don't, I don't know if everyone knows that that's required, if these plaintiff's attorneys know, but we have seen several lawsuits that have been um, started as a result of data breaches, um, and they're in process. And also the Attorney General of California has regulatory authority over compliance, and that, that compliance will start July 1st with a look back to January 1. Right, and, and just to add on to that, I mean, clearly uh, we track a lot of these as they unfold, like I mentioned earlier, right? So as the laws come out initially, and then once they start reaching the court, uh, the courts rather, and are uh, tried, which way, you know, which way they lean uh, going to, is going to determine you know, down the road, how we guide our clients as well, right? So it's it's not all unfortunately black and white. Uh, so an eye, keeping an eye on that is is definitely paramount and, and a prudent move for for organizations that are struggling with with some of these privacy uh, laws that have come out. 
Awesome. Thank you both. Um, the next question from Dan, and I'm actually going to answer this one. So hopefully I don't mess it up. No, it's, it's pretty easy. So I, I'm pretty sure I'll be safe on this one. Uh, so Dan asks, has Compass IT Compliance developed and actively using any documentation such as checklists, audit procedures, et cetera, to specifically help organizations mitigate current remote worker and returning worker risks? So the answer to that, the short answer is yes. Um, so we have a number of different tools and checklists on our website. Uh, that included data privacy health check, uh, telecommuting uh, network security checklist, and a pandemic planning checklist for businesses that are all available, as I mentioned, uh, on the Compass website at compassitc.com under the resources section. And then we offer a variety of different services around pandemic planning, IT policy templates, uh, and vulnerability assessment services to kind of assist in that process as well. Um, Jerry, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add, but no, that's why I felt comfortable answering that one. Yeah, Jeff, I, thanks for taking the softball one. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, we do have, you know, behind the scenes to more uh, deeper dive on some of that, whether to, it's a risk assessment or an audit. And, you know, uh, we've got the tools to assist clients in that arena. And I, um, so that question was directed directly at Compass, but I'll, I'll defer to Lynn too, because Lynn, I'm sure you've got uh, those, those privacy tools and, and, legal guidance that you provide your clients. And if you'd want to share some of that, it'd be great. Yeah. And I, th well, I think that um, this has been a great conversation because um, it really is teamwork between the, you know, the Compass IT, Robinson and Cole, uh, the, the uh, assessors, the technical assessors and the legal compliance. I, you know, we complement each other. I don't think either one of our, our firms could, could do the whole job. And I rely on Compass um, to provide the technical assistance. Um, and then I can make sure that it complies. And I think that for at least this audience, it, this has been a, a great way to show how it, it really is a, a, a teamwork, uh, it, it's, a, it's a teamwork project. You can't you can't have a complete project and say it's compliant without both of us. So I think that um, a lot of companies will try to do it. Like I I can't do it all myself. I need Compass. You can't say it's legally compliant. You need us. So I I think that this has been a, a great way to show how in order to have a complete program, you need both parts of it. Yeah, that's a good point, Lynn. One of the things I tell you, we explicitly say to our auditors and our security professionals uh, not to delve into that uh, legal world, right? So, so while we may provide some templates and some, some basic guidance, we end it with, you know, le you know reach out to your legal counsel or you know, firms like yours, Lynn, to, to make sure that you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's. We do not want to get into that uh, ourselves. We're not equipped for that. And, um, you know, we advise our folks. So I would say to the folks listening today, if you've, you're, you're looking into you know, having some of these services performed and you've got a company sitting in front of you that's an IT auditor security firm and they're saying, to you, yeah, I've got it all, I can do it all, that'd be a red flag for me if they're not involving legal. The other thing that I would add, and a, a case just came out that I, I actually wrote a blog on, Capital One was just um, ordered by a judge last week to give up the mm -hmm. forensic report from Mandiant after the data breach because Mandiant, because Mandiant was on retainer with Capital One. So what I uh, really want to also impress upon the, the listeners is when you're getting any type of a, a, an assessment that is a roadmap to your vulnerabilities, I would be reaching out to counsel and asking counsel to retain and do a three-way with your IT professional with your security professional so that you can try to keep it under the cloak of attorney client privilege work product doctrine or in anticipation of litigation. Um, Experian had a case a couple of years ago that we've all relied on. I've been doing this for, for 10 years. Um, but the Capital One case last week was a, a real eye opener that anytime just just be thinking about if that security risk assessment if that vol you know if that pen testing if that vulnerability assessment gets to, into the hands of a of a plaintiff's attorney ooh it's it's not a good thing so so really be thinking about how you can protect the the um, the underbelly and everybody's got it you know every no security risk assessment comes out clean 
the whole point is to find your vulnerabilities and to find your gaps. But it, it was a, it was an eye opener this past week. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the next question, are there any certifications around privacy? Sure. I'll, if I'll go first. I mean, you know, I mentioned that our, our group has gone through, um, you know, there's certifications from different organizations. Like SACA has one, you know, certified data privacy solutions engineers. And, um, you know, I mentioned about, I think about eight or 10 of our team members, both on the audit side and security side have gone, gone through that as well. You know, and um, but there are other firms out there that do it as, uh, as well, not just ISACA, but they're popping up more more often, which what does that tell you? I mean, there's a definite need for uh, considerations uh, in, in the privacy arena. Finally, I think folks are finally taking it uh, more seriously. Um, and I think this, again, pandemic with COVID has really kicked people in the butt and, and, and presented so many new opportunities uh, that are really uh, for bad actors, really, uh, that um, need to be addressed. Um, from the from my perspective, the uh, the gold standard for privacy professionals, including lawyers, anyone who would be a privacy officer or in compliance, the gold standard is getting a uh, certification from the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and you get your certification as an information privacy professional. It's called a SIP certification. It's really the only one for privacy professionals, lawyers. Um, so that's, it would be through the IAPP. All right, perfect. Thank you both. Um, another question here from Andrew, and this is another, he asks very good questions. I'm not going to lie. This is a good one too. So on the subject of NIST frameworks and privacy in the scenario where a security framework such as NIST 800-171, 800-53, or CMMC comes to odds to what would normally be disallowed or frowned upon by conventional privacy concerns, both for employees and customers, such as individual activities or data, which would or should take precedence, the security of the data or the individual privacy concern? Lynn, we're going to start with you because that wow. sounds like the legal one. <laughs> That's so unfair. Um, so I, think I, I think I missed... The CMMC, I, I know that's the DOD CMMC, but I, right. um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to cop out and this is what I'm going to say. And this is what I always say. It's really easy to defend when you do the right thing. Right. It's really yeah. easy to defend when you do yeah. the right thing. So, um, if there if there's contradictory if you think there's contradictory regulations or requirements, um, I would go with the stricter, and I would do what I always refer to as what is the the most ethical from a data collection perspective. Did I answer that? I think, I think so. Good. I think that's good. You know, I'd add on it with the, you know, you threw a number of acronyms out there and the ones I heard with the NIST and such, these aren't regulations, these are frameworks, these are uh, certainly guidelines to, to help organizations uh, get their, you know, their act together, that is to impl implement programs, in this case, for data privacy, um, for a lot of this information. Uh, the CMMC, you know, you're looking in there with respect to maturity model type stuff where you're, you're taking programs and, and over time measuring uh, performance improvements uh, for the organization as adhere as a adhering to whether it's a law or in the case of NIST, it's a framework or, uh, or guidance or guidelines uh, on that. So, um, but I agree with what Lynn's saying. You know, you look at this merit of all these, whether it's like you rambled off or Andrew did, rather to you know these frameworks and guidelines and things, and you know understand what they are first of all, right? Some of them, you know, if there's a law in there, you need to know, you need to know that, and the answer would be those are the laws that you need to adhere to. So whether when you mention the privacy information, that's going to trump a, a framework. Uh, it's going to, you know, it's going to trump some of the uh, guidelines that are that are just, you know, yeah. recommended to help you. But the laws are the ones that the organizations need to adhere to. These guidelines and frameworks are merely tools to help you achieve those objectives. Excellent, good, great answer, both of you. That was good stuff, uh, Lynn. I hate to put you on the spot, but this one's for you as well. Um, so. This is an anonymous one too, so we, we can't uh, give anybody. Oh, oh so such I, a coward! Uh, <laughs> it was a tough one, Andrew. 
I'm going to bet it's Andrew again. <laughs> no, Andrew puts his name. So, all right. So the next one, Lynn, the CCPA, you say it doesn't lend itself to easy compliance statements like a NIST privacy or even GDPR does. Do you have a source or sources that you like for CCPA information? No. Uh, well, the, the California Attorney General's website is a very good place to go because they're the regulator and when they send out guidance, you want to listen. Um, so uh, really everything coming out of the California Attorney General's office, we, we watch very carefully. When I say it's difficult to comply with, um, I'm talking about the technical aspects of it. I, I have done so many CCPA compliance programs for clients. It's changing your privacy policy on the website, making sure, you know, following the law to a T. Like we know how to do that. I did that with HIPAA way back when, right? So I know we know how to comply with the law. When I'm talking about compliance, I'm talking about the ability to respond to consumers when they ask you to access their data, when they ask you to delete their data. How do you delete their data if it's on a backup system along with everybody else's data? So, so that's what I'm talking about. We, I, can, I can do all the documentation and say you now are compliant with CCPA. What I'm talking about is actually if someone sends you a request to access their records, do you have a process in place where you can actually respond to that? If someone asks you to delete their record, do you have a process in place to be able to respond to that? And can you actually do it? Yeah, and I, I would add on, right? So whether it's California's Consumer Privacy Act or, or uh, other state um, laws that are coming out and some that are out already, on, I mean, every state has some privacy provisions, but, but the newer ones are really more aggressive. And, and the answer is, um, as Lynn suggests, each state has sites for that, right? And the Attorney General is typically the governor of those uh, an enforcer of those um, laws that are coming out. So start with those, and that's uh, that's a good starting point. And, and as it relates to, you know, again going back to some of the complexity uh, that organizations or maybe anxiety organizations feel about where to start and all that. You know, begin with knowing where your information is. And I'll, I'll tell you one one quick note. You know, folks always ask, you know, what's the biggest way of reducing my scope? That is, you know, when I'm looking at um, protecting certain information. And, and people always say, well, you know. From a network perspective, it's network segmentation. And that's really, really probably one of the second best ways. The first is not to maintain the information if you don't need it for business purposes, right? So, so start with that. If I don't need it, don't, don't maintain it. Then, then let's understand where it does live. Let's run tools to scan our network to determine those unknown sources of the, the private information of consumers. And let's move to eradicate those that are uh, unauthorized and, and put in policies and procedures in place and enforce that we monitor these to ensure that so it's not just one scan it's moved to clean up and then scan again and let's keep your arms around it this is a moving target and, and like lynn said earlier i think there's, there's no silver bullet to all this right there's there's a lot of pieces and and even when you have your arms around the regulations or even strong controls that you recommend uh i can go into two similar businesses and, and apply it differently right so it's it has to do with their culture as well so a lot of pieces that's why i recommend if you're not comfortable and you don't have the resources in-house, reach out to firms like Compass uh, and Robinson. I mean, that's just best advice. It's a marathon, not a sprint, right, Jerry? There you go, buddy. Good stuff. All right, so I'll, uh, I'll open this up to panelists, uh, to participants uh, one more time here, the attendees. If you have any questions, please put them in the, in the Q&A. We're on to what for the moment is our final question, uh, unless anybody puts another one in there. So uh, this one, I'll read it off here. It's from Derek, and it says, uh, HIPAA data deals with data privacy for medical data. Many organizations' legal advice tell them they are not covered entities or business associates and therefore don't need to comply. However, would that medical data come under state privacy laws such as CCPA? So I'll, I'll take that first. Um, there, there's, a, there's been, since HIPAA was enacted, there, there have been myths that HIPAA attaches to all health information, and it doesn't. It doesn't attach to information that an employer would have under FMLA, ADA, um, et cetera, on the employment side. Um, so in the last five years, state laws 
many state laws have included, including Rhode Island, have, have included health information generally as, it, as protected information, protected personal information, that if there's an unauthorized access user disclosure of that information, it is a reportable data breach. And um, there, all 50 states are different. I will tell you they're all different. A lot of them are the same. There's some risk analyses, et cetera. But from my perspective, in the practical sense, whether HIPAA applies to that health information or not, you should be protecting that health information just as you would if it fell under HIPAA. And so, um, and it's really more for the breach notification requirements as a result of an unauthorized access user disclosure. But I would say that that's true about all, you know, highly sensitive information, health information of your employees or your consumers. I would protect it as if it were under the security rule even though it's not, but I'd be really careful about calling myself a covered entity or a business associate, because if you're not one, you don't want to be one. Yeah, good points. So we work with a lot of um, higher eds, as I mentioned, I think earlier, and, and you know, it, it's funny the way, or interesting the way HIPAA was written though, right? With respect to um, information, uh, healthcare information on students, if it's not billed, billable information that, it, um, you know, build, for services rendered, uh, if it's part of, say, the tuition, for example, it doesn't fall under HIPAA, and and that's interesting and perplexing. But I, I tell my clients, guys, you know, here's the deal: pick your acronym. It's still PII. It's still, you know, and I deal the same thing with, you know, um, information in in, in uh, whether it's PCI information, payment card information. It's you know, we're dealing with PCI, which is also PII, which is you know, and in, in the case of EPHI, electronic healthcare information. You know, it, it, there's an acronym somewhere. So, so understand your data. I'm going to go back to that. Know it, know it, know where it is, and be be conservative and, and smart about how you maintain it and protect it in a secure manner. Have programs in place to monitor and ensure that as systems change and, and folks change, that we are you know changing along with that to maintain the same controls around that confidential information. Whether your name of your business is in the uh, the news uh, for um, EPHI or PII. You're in the news. It's bad. You're going to be pay paying uh, penalties, and and there's there's ramifications to that. And honestly, some of the penalties um, for these different regulations pale in comparison to the reputational damage of organizations um, that have been compromised. So, uh, I, my biggest advice is take it seriously and and reach out to to skilled uh, firms that can can help you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, that wraps up. It looks like the questions that were submitted in by the attendees. So at this point in time, we'll go ahead and we'll move to close the webinar. Uh, Jerry, Lynn, I want to thank you both for taking the time to uh, present today. Uh, I know it was uh, a lot of information and you guys did an awesome job. And I, I think there's a lot of value in what you guys shared. So I appreciate you both taking the time to, to present to uh, a large group of folks here. So um, thank you to the attendees. Uh, I know that time is, is valuable, so appreciate everyone who was able to register and attend to, uh, to take the time out of their day to spend an hour and 15 minutes or so with us. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we're, this is being recorded. We will have it posted to our YouTube channel later this week. Um, so you'll get an email with an update when that is actually live. So if you want to go back and rewatch it or share it or whatever the case might be, you'll get that notification. Uh, and the last thing I'll leave you with is, you know, uh, as we progress through uh, these kind of changing at uncertain times, uh, we're going to be doing our cybersecurity symposium again this year for the fourth year, but it's virtual. So uh, we're not going to have a large group of people. So uh, if you have an interest, we're going to have a, a lineup of speakers for that as well. So feel free to uh, visit our website, compassitc.com. And it's right on the homepage banner there. You can register and that's going to be on September 30th. So again, thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, appreciate everyone's time and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Thank you, folks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. I really appreciate it. Fun. <laughs>